fit actually very nicely in our picture of how structure in the universe forms. Structure in the universe forms what we say hierarchically, which means by mergers and acquisitions, essentially. What happens basically is that first you formed small building blocks of galaxies, those merge to form bigger things, those then merge to form bigger things until you get the grand design spirals you see today and the elliptical galaxies you see today. So the first building blocks were smaller, the universe was then smaller and denser, therefore there were more collisions, and as a result, the morphologies were more disturbed. Now, with an eye towards the future now, because I said I'll tol tell you a little bit of what we're going to do with the new instruments, we just installed on board Hubble the Wide Field Camera 3, which has on it an infrared channel. Now, because the universe is expanding, of course, the farther you go, things are shifted more and more towards the red. So if you want to see the very distant universe, you have to look in the infrared. So I can tell you that very, very soon, and by that I mean perhaps even this coming month already, we'll take an observation like the Hubble Ultra Deep Field with this infrared channel on board Wide Field Camera 3, and this will give us an even deeper image of the universe than we ever had. Eventually, we will need the James Webb Space Telescope, which will be Hubble's successor, which is entirely an infrared telescope, to give us a, a, an image of the very first galaxies in the universe. Now, uh, we can use these deep images to tell us something else. We can tell at what rate the universe as a whole was forming new stars. Not some given galaxy, the whole universe, at what rate it was forming new stars. Now, we already knew before Hubble, here we are here, the universe is now almost 14 billion years old. We already knew that some seven or eight billion years ago, the universe was forming new stars as a whole at a higher rate than it is today. But with Hubble, we now looked at when the universe was less than one billion years old, and we discovered that the universe then was already forming new stars at a higher rate than it is doing it today. So once the universe started forming stars, it started to do that furiously. It reached a peak some seven or so billion years ago. Ten years ago, the rate of star formation in the universe has been declining. The universe was at the beginning very hot, and therefore all the atoms were ionized. When the universe expanded, it cooled down, and when it was about 400,000 years old, all the electrons were caught inside atoms. We call this recombination. The cosmic microwave background that we see comes from that time. However, there were still no sources of light then there. There were still no stars, no galaxies, you know, and so on. At some point, the first sources of light started appearing. And each source of such light, because it has ultraviolet radiation, ionized its neighborhood. Those spheres of ionization then increased, started overlapping, and eventually the whole universe, the whole intergalactic medium was re-ionized. We're now seeing this process as it happened. It happened between redshift 13 and 6 thereabouts. So from a few hundred million years to about a billion years. Extrasolar planets. <coughs> So you're all in interested in Mars, rightfully so. And, but you know that until 1992, we did not know of a single planet outside our solar system. In our old solar system, we knew nine then. We know eight now, because Pluto was demoted. Uh, but uh, we did not know of a single planet outside our own solar system. In 1992, we discovered the first planets around another star, but that was a peculiar star. It was a pulsar, which is this very dense object and so on. The first planet around a sun-like star was discovered in 1995, so only 14 years ago. In these 14 years, we now know of more than 350 extrasolar planets orbiting other stars. Most of these planets were discovered from the ground, not by Hubble but Hubble contributed a few 
absolutely unique observations to this field. And let me show you just a few of those. In a few very rare cases, the planet actually goes, you know, our line of sight is such that the planet eclipses its parent star. When that happens, the light of the star dims by about 1 to 2 percent. This is, these are real observations by Hubble of one such dimming of 1 to 2 percent. And Hubble can see this dimming with high, high precision. In fact, when the planet goes in front of its star, the planet blocks some light, but the atmosphere of the planet also absorbs some of the light coming from the star. And by looking at wavelengths that correspond to particular atoms, we can tell which atoms are in this planet atmosphere. And in this case, we discovered sodium. In another planet, we discovered even methane and water, in fact in this planet's atmosphere. So Hubble is now telling us the composition of the atmosphere of some extrasolar planets. In addition, in this particular case, this star Tres 1, look here again, the dimming because the star went in front of the planet, but look here at the bottom of this little eclipse, suddenly there is this bump. You know why that happened? The planet went in front of a star spot just like a sunspot. So with these observations, we actually discovered star spots on another star. Most of the extrasolar planets were discovered in the solar neighborhood, not too far from the sun. But one observation that Hubble did was in the bulge of our galaxy, halfway across our galaxy, across our galaxy. Served for a whole week, 140,000 stars and we discovered 16 candidates of planets around these stars. So we found basically that the frequency of planets is about the same all across the galaxy, which tells us that in our own Milky Way galaxies there are billions of planets. Hubble also imaged the very first extrasolar planet. This is around the star Fomalhaut. You know, all the other planets were, are generally discovered by radial velocity, namely by their tug on their star and the motion that it induces. In this case, we were able to actually image this planet around this star. Supermassive black holes uh, and, uh, in, in centers of galaxies. We knew that there are supermassive black holes in other galaxies. There is one in, in our own galaxy, Milky Way galaxy. It is about four million times the mass of the sun. But Hubble showed that there is essentially at the center of every galaxy, or at least every galaxy that has a bulge of stars at its center, has a supermassive black hole at its center. These black holes range in mass from a few million solar masses to a few billion solar masses. This galaxy here, M87, has a black hole at its center with a mass of about 3 billion solar masses. It also has this very powerful jet, which we see with Hubble. The jet, we think, uh, is formed when this supermassive black hole accretes mass onto it. The mass forms a disk around the black hole, and then there are two jets powered from the centers of this disk. This is one of these very powerful jets. But Hubble discovered something more. By the way, how do we discover that there is a black hole there? If there is no black hole, then stars in the neighborhood of the black hole, of, of the center, just move every which way. When there is a black hole, then the stars move in a more regular fashion. By being able to resolve individual stars at the centers of the galaxies and determining how they all move, we were able to determine the presence of the black holes and their masses. But Hubble discovered something more. He discovered that there is a tight relation between the mass of the black hole and the mass of the central bulge of stars at the centers of these galaxies. In particular, the more massive the bulge, the more massive the black hole. And that tells us that it is not that the galaxy and the black hole don't know about each other. You know, it's not that the galaxy evolves, the black hole evolves, and they really don't care about each other. The fact that the 
mass of the black hole is tightly correlated with the mass of the bulge.